Okay, I think we can start. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's joint colloquium. We are very excited and very happy to have Richard Anderson visiting us today from EPFL in Switzerland. Um, so Richard obtained his PhD in 2013 from the Univers University of Geneva and then moved to the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore in the US, where he spent three years as a postdoctoral fellow. From there, he moved on to um, become an ESO fellow in Garching, close to Munich, from 2017 to 2020. And since um, early 2021, he has been back in Switzerland um, at EPFL, where he is an ERC starting grant holder and an Excellenza grant holder. And he is an expert in stellar astrophysics, especially with respect to studying pulsating stars, which he, I think, will talk about quite a bit today as well. Um, the title of his talk is Measuring Hubble's Constant to 1% Precision Using Pulsating Stars. Welcome, Richard, to Heidelberg, and thank you very much for giving this talk today. Thank you very much, Dominica, and thank you, everyone, for being here today so numerously, and also uh, hello to the online crowd. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, as I was looking for places to do my uh, graduate, my undergraduate studies, actually, I almost would have moved to Heidelberg and opted for Göttingen instead. But maybe I'm not. I shouldn't talk about that too much here on premises. So it's really a pleasure to uh, shout out my collaborators, especially my uh, my team members: Mauricio Cruz Rey, Sanya Khan, uh, Bastian Lengen, uh, Shriya Shete, Zoe Spazieri, and Giordano Viviani, as well as uh, some other collaborators who have contributed to the work that I'm presenting today. Notably, of course, the uh, members of the Shoes team that are really leading uh, this current distance ladder that has uh, yielded great improvements in the measurements of the Hubble constant, Adam Reese and Stefano Casertano, as well as Laurent Ayer, my PhD advisor in Geneva, who I work with still uh, using Gaia data, and also uh, Bogomir Pilecki in Poland, uh, whom I'm working with on binary cephates. So, uh, as Dominica mentioned, uh, this talk is about the Hubble constant and about how we can get to a 1% measurement on this very important parameter. And it's my understanding uh, that a bit of an introduction is warranted, so I'll just repeat some of the, uh, of the important basics that are underlying this measurement. So the Hubble constant, of course, measures the expansion rate of the of space today, of the universe today, and is one of the most common, uh, most fundamental parameters of cosmology because it sets both an age and a size to the observable universe. And uh, in its original form, as uh, mentioned by Hubble and so on, uh, this relates the recession velocity, the apparent recession velocity of galaxies to their luminosity distance. Of course, in reality, it's a little bit more involved where you really need to do this Taylor expansion of the Friedman equation and so on. But still, you see here that this uh, CZ term is essentially for small um, numbers can be treated pretty much like a velocity. But you do have things in here like the Q naught, the deceleration parameter for acceleration and the jerk parameter and so on. But what this constant here tells us, V over D, is that space in between objects is growing. So you probably know all this, uh, this idea of having the, the balloon, uh, with, you draw the points on the balloon, you blow air into the balloon, and the space between objects is growing. And what, when that happens, you will see this kind of uh, parameter here. So the Hubble constant, in addition to being so fundamental for our understanding of the size and age of the universe, is also a really interesting end-to-end -end test for cosmology. Since I live in Switzerland, I'm going to demonstrate this with uh, an analogy that involves a mountain, where essentially we're trying to connect observations from the very early universe and our understanding of said observations that uh, is seen through the lens of the Lambda CDM cosmological model, and we're trying to connect this to today's universe, the stars and the galaxies that we can observe today and where we can measure Hubble's constant at redshift zero. And in a way, what this corresponds to is digging a tunnel from two ends uh, of the universe. And those two tunnels should ideally meet if we have a good understanding of what's happening in between all of this, right? We're at a redshift of 1100 or so on the left and redshift zero on the right. If our understanding of cosmology is correct, then those two machines should meet. 
However, what we're faced with instead is a Hubble tension, a Hubble discord, people use different words, but really what they're referring to is a systematic difference between values that are measured in today's universe versus what Lambda CDM and the cosmic microwave background tell us in the early universe. And this difference is around 8%. That may not seem like very much, but given the uncertainties, it is significant at 5.0 sigma. So 5 sigma is, of course, one of these numbers in particle physics would constitute a discovery, and uh, that is behind all of this excitement that is coming from this Hubble tension. Now, of course, one of the interesting things that we could ask is maybe our machines were poorly calibrated, and we really needed to dig the tunnel somewhere else, and then we would have come out to meet those two points and we would uh, simply have a measurement error. That's actually a lot of what I do. Uh, I study stars initially, and so I try to uh, essentially improve the measurement so that we can maybe get rid of this tension. However, more excitingly, maybe there's something more to be learned here. Maybe there's some new physics that we haven't understood. And to be honest, I'm agnostic as to what that may be. I'm not a theoretical cosmologist, but I think it's really exciting because when you probe where things are going wrong, that's when you're poised to learn something new. So how do we get to this measurement? What does that really involve? You may have already seen this uh, uh, diagram of the cosmic distance ladder uh, that uh, Shoes team has been publishing since 2016. Now, of course, with the, the latest data shown here from the um, 2022 data release of the Shoes team. And the idea in, in essence is that in order to measure the Hubble constant, you need to map isotropic expansion of space in the so-called Hubble flow. So you need to go to redshifts where space is uh, expanding isotropically. And you do that using supernovae, which are extremely luminous sources. So type 1a supernovae, they're extremely luminous. So you can probe really long distances. However, is everything okay? Okay. However, the type 1a supernovae, they're really rare. And so you don't just uh, observe them in galaxies to which you already know the distance, you require an intermediate calibration step. And this intermediate calibration step is provided by galaxies that we often refer to as supernova host uh, galaxies, but we might as well call them Cepheid host galaxies, where Cepheids and supernovae are measured in the same galaxy. Now, one might say that these galaxies are close enough for us to observe the Cephades in them, but they're distant enough for us to have a significant number of type 1a supernovae, given that the volumetric rate of type 1a supernovae is relatively low. Now, the supernova is, of course, completely obvious in this image. This is M101. It's the closest type 1a supernovae uh, in modern times. But... Uh, the Cephades are a little bit more conspicuous, but thankfully, when we turn on the time domain, we see characteristic light variations at characteristic uh, timescales that we can easily classify as Cephades, and this is thanks to Henrietta Leavitt, shown here, uh, looking at light curves, that we know that the periodicity of these objects correlates directly with their intrinsic luminosity. And so thanks to this relation, we have a way of easily inferring the absolute magnitude of the star from the period. We can measure the apparent uh, magnitude, and that allows us to measure distances. Of course, this calibration requires calibration, and that is done nowadays using Gaia parallaxes, notably, as well as the distance to the LMC that is known to about 1% from detached eclipsing binaries, and with NGC 4258, a mega maser host galaxy to which a geometric distance has been measured by the masers that are orbiting a, a central supermassive black hole. And so what this distance ladder in a sense is doing is it's linking this angular scale coming from parallaxes to the angular scales provided by the cosmic microwave background. That is the idea of what we're trying to do here uh, in sort of the most basic terms. Now, classical Cepheids are actually really good for doing this, uh, and there are several reasons. They're not perfect, but they're really good, and I'd like to shout out a few of those. One that I find important is that every Cepheid is a standard candle. You can look at a Cepheid, you can measure its uh, period, you can measure its distance, its luminosity, uh, and so you can actually easily calibrate this relationship directly. Not all stellar standard candles behave this way. You also have characteristic variability that allows you to really classify cleanly which of the stars you're looking at are the ones that you want to measure. That gives you a tight PL relation with uh, very little scatter and uh, small scatter and minimal contamination. And in terms of the understanding coming from stellar evolution, they're really well understood. 
we have an error of about 10% or so in the luminosity scale from the models. We don't use those models to measure the Hubble constant, but nonetheless, I don't think that there's any other standard candle to which we have a better understanding in terms of the luminosity. So some people may say, well, Hubble tension, that's really, that's an old hat, you know, uh, the Hubble wars um, uh, in the past have already told us that, yes, the Hubble constant uh, is really discrepant. People have been fighting over whether it's 50 or 100, and now we're at 75, so who cares? This kind of diagram that you often see would probably also kind of push you in this direction where you see, okay, the C and B value uh, at the time when Planck came out really moved downward to a lower value of the Hubble constant. The Cephades are up here and maybe the tip of the red giant branch is really the right value to use because it falls in the middle. However, I think that's not the whole story. If you look at different uh, measurements here of the Hubble constant, you can easily separate them out into early universe infer inferred values on the left of this uh, dashed line and then measurements that are more direct in today's universe, and they all fall on one side of the, hub, of the Planck value. They do not scatter to both sides of the value coming from Planck. So there is really something here. Of course, it's difficult to tell exactly where it's coming from. Uh, some of these measurements are entirely independent. Some de depend to some degree on one another. Uh, but in particular, I will be focusing on the most precise of these measurements coming from the Cephates and the supernovae. <clears throat> Now, in the same way, in the same uh, vein, uh, as I just mentioned, that this Hubble tension is nothing like the Hubble Wars from before, I'd just like to say a few things about the key improvements that have taken place since the key project measured the Hubble constant in, uh, in 2001. So nowadays, we really have a precise, differentially calibrated distance ladder that is based on good trigonomet trigonometric parallaxes on the absolute scale. Uh, among the anchor galaxies, we have the LMC, whose distance is now known to 1%, NGC 4258 to 1.5% or so, plus hundreds of parallaxes of Cephates. We have exclusive use of the HST photometric system, which nullifies any sort of photometric transformation problems. Uh, and that system is also exquisitely calibrated and very well known. You even have count rate nonlinearity calibrations to take into account the large uh, dynamic range uh, that these Cephates fall on. You really have detailed background corrections, uh, checks of these uh, photometric light curves using variability amplitudes, even the shapes of the light curves and so on. And in terms of the experimental setup, uh, we have lots of improvements, for example, do, uh, related to reddening, uh, where we can have this Wiesenheit magnitudes that, uh, assuming a reddening law, actually get rid of the extinction problematic under the uh, issue of having to assume the reddening law, of course. Now, we also have covariance included in this fit because it is one entire fit at once. It is not a step-by-step -step process anymore as it used to be. And uh, thanks to something like 18 uh, cycles of HST data, there are now 42 supernovae, type 1a supernovae in 37 supernova hosts and more than 300 clean type 1a supernovae in the Hubble flow that are used to do this measurement. So, in order to really understand how the CMB and today's uh, Hubble constant fit together, we need to put these two measurements on a similar precision level. And this is where this uh, motivation for the 1% measurement comes from. At present, the precision that the shoes team has achieved is about 1.4%. And we want to get to this 1%. And in the rest of this presentation, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we can get there and possibly uh, what could uh, be some of the roadblocks in the way. Now, I think we need to figure uh, the dominant uncertainties first, and this is related to the absolute calibration of this luminosity scale, of course, where we need distances in order to calibrate the Levitt law or the absolute luminosity uh, of the Cephades. And of course, we need to then measure precisely the distances using this Levitt law. And so uh, these two rungs uh, it can be shown uh, and is uh, shown very nicely in the shoes analyses that these are the driving uncertainties. The, set, the supernovae part is about 0.4% uh, of the 1.4% error budget uh, in total. So with the Hipsters project or measuring Hubble's constant to 1%, we're really trying to do three things. We're trying to increase the precision of the pulsating star distances, but noting that precision can also lead us to a biased 
value that is off. And that, of course, would be the thing to avoid as we're trying to understand whether there's maybe new physics implied by this tension. We also want to ensure trueness by analyzing systematics. And in particular, we're focusing on the systematics uh, related to the pulsating stars and their absolute calibration. And then, of course, we also would like to underline this with a very good theoretical understanding of these stars. And so we're also looking at uh, theoretical models of Cepheids, of course, and variability measures. So let me get first to a few words about Gaia, because Gaia, of course, is fundamental to calibrating uh, the Levitt law using parallaxes. One of the unfortunate parts about Gaia is that it's not free from systematics itself. And um, some people in this audience may know more about this than I do, in fact, uh, because, of course, there's lots of Gaia um, work happening here in Heidelberg. This is a map from uh, Lindegren 2021 paper that shows the distribution of uh, parallaxes offset by mi 17 micro arc second of quasars. So quasars and Gaia have a non-zero average parallax. That's unfortunate because quasars are, of course, extragalactic objects whose parallax should be statistically zero, even though parallax measurements can fluctuate in both directions, of course. But this kind of uh, map has been understood quite well to be a combination of a magnitude effect, a color effect, and a position on sky effect that is already uh, accounted for by a calibration that is given by Linda Grenadal in 2021. However, it turns out that this uh, offset here, this delta Z, this is a residual uncertainty uh, that applies after the correction by Linda Gren to the Gaia parallaxes has been applied it appears that there is a kind of magnitude dependent uh, offset that still resides there. So there's a kind of a residual parallax offset, which is extremely annoying for us because Cepheids in the Milky Way that we would like to calibrate the distance ladder are in the sort of six to 11 or so uh, magnitude range for Gaia. Uh, and it appears that there is a, maybe about a 15 micro arc second offset that is still there. So this is not a showstopper, but this is a cost that you incur when you want to use Cepheids to calibrate the distance ladder. You can actually solve for this offset as you're measuring the Hubble constant, but it comes as a cost of precision. Now, thankfully, uh, as you go to fainter magnitudes, it turns out that this residual bias goes away. And this can be understood by the fact that uh, the processing within Gaia is magnitude dependent because certain magnitudes uh, would lead to saturation on the detector. And so there's a very sophisticated processing involving gates and different window classes that gets rid of this kind of problem. So uh, the um, understanding this kind of uh, residual bias is of paramount importance to get the most uh, accurate parallax calibration. Now, there's another thing, another systematic within Gaia parallaxes that's related to angular covariance which means that objects that are close by on sky are not fully independent of one another. And so that will lead to an error floor as you're combining measurements from uh, many sources that are close by on sky. And this in particular applies to stellar open clusters, which typically probe scales of about less than uh, a degree or so. I'm telling you all of this because we recently had this paper um, where we were using where we we're using um, stellar open uh, Milky Way open clusters in order to get even better um, Gaia parallaxes, and uh, this is essentially driven by two things. On the one hand, we have a precision gain for stellar clusters because we have many stars here shown in yellow rather than just a single star to which we measure parallax. So we gain in precision by combining these, but we do of course have this angular covariance, which thankfully is well calibrated already using stars in the, in the LMC, for example. So we're um, furthermore able to use these fainter cluster member stars rather than the bright Cepheids to go to the regime where the Lindegren calibration is accurate. And we can show that the variance here of uh, the measured parallax minus the um, average cluster parallax is very stable within a given magnitude range. And so we can calibrate the average parallaxes of these clusters in this ideal range where the Lindegren calibrations are accurate. And then, uh, sorry, I have a hard time seeing. Uh, and so in total, when we figure both the improved statistical precision and the better systematic 
accuracy, we have a typical uncertainty of about seven micro arc seconds for these cluster parallaxes, which is of order three times better than what we have for individual parallaxes in the Milky Way. So here's a picture of Mauricio Cruz, uh, who's, who's done this work. Some of these examples we see here where you have the cluster and maybe the Cepheid in the center, the Cepheid a bit off center. We did a detailed analysis of these membership criteria uh, using HDB scan and then an additional likelihood calculation and came up with a sample of 34 Cepheids in 28 clusters, of which three are new identifications. There were some host clusters that were corrected based on what was previously in the literature. And an interesting number also for those interested in galactic uh, astronomy here is that the clustered Cepheid fraction within two kiloparsecs of the sun is roughly 9%. So then using these uh, cluster Cepheids, we can use the cluster parallaxes to set the absolute scale for the Levitt law. And we can solve at the same time for the residual offset of the other field Cepheids. And this is what we did in this combined fit here using the astrometry-based luminosity uh, formalism that allows us to, to work in linear parallax space. So that's why this, uh, this Levitt law looks curved in this case. It's a bit of a funky way of, uh, of working with parallaxes. And when we're doing this kind of combined fit, we get to an absolute magnitude in this Wesenheit um, magnitude for G-band and BPRP color of minus around six. And uh, we measure the offset of the field Cephades relative to the cluster Cephades to be minus 19 plus or minus three, which is six, um, uh, six sigma significant, consistent with what the shoes team found in a completely different analysis, but uh, well, more precise in that sense. We also do this for different photometric bands. So here we have BP, V band, G band, RP, and then F160, which is kind of an H band coming from Hubble. And we can see really how the Levitt law uh, with its um, slope and intercept operates as a function of uh, luminosity. So interestingly enough, these cluster Cephids, as I just mentioned, they, are, they provide a more accurate basis for the absolute Levitt law calibration. And if we're combining this now with new HST photometry that uh, Adam recently published, then we get uh, this kind of diagram. This now shows absolute magnitude as a function of logarithm of the period. So this is a more familiar way of looking at the PL relation. And you see here in red, the cluster Cephades, and you just see by eye that the scatter among these points is extremely small. There's very little room for additional systematics because otherwise that would lead to increased scatter in this relation. And by comparison, the gray points here are the field Cephades. So, uh, Actually, this sigma of 0.07 magnitudes seen here for the Milky Way is of the same order as what we have otherwise in the LMC. So we have LMC-like scatter among Milky Way uh, Cephades. And thanks to the better precision, three times better precision is about a nine times weight in this uh, PL relation. So these cluster Cephades are extremely useful. And uh, both in this Wiesenheit uh, formalism in the infrared that is used for the shoes distance ladder, as well as for the Gaia Wiesenheit that we otherwise calibrate, we get to this 0.9% accuracy on the 10-day uh, fiducial luminosity of Cepheids. Interestingly enough, so in this work here, uh, the astrometric processing of the clusters was done entirely independent. This was done by... Um, Antat Godin, uh, what is his first name? I forget now. Um, but he did the analysis of the clusters for this work. Mauricio Cruz Reyes did an entirely independent analysis, other than it's, of course, still Gaia data, but the, the processing was done completely different. So we have different memberships, and we have uh, around a five micro arc second average difference between, uh, the dif between the average cluster parallaxes. But in terms of the absolute magnitude scales, we're completely consistent. Uh, and then combining this new prior on the 10-day absolute luminosity gives us an improved measurement of the Hubble constant of 73.15 plus or minus 0.97 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which ends up increasing the tension uh, from 5.0 to 5.3 sigma. So of course, this is a small effect, but you know, you improve your measurement, you come out with a higher tension. I think we're onto something. I think this is going... Uh, Otherwise, you would expect somehow that significance to go down, right? 
So we're also trying, of course, to see how else maybe these parallaxes are wrong. And one of the things that we're doing in our group is we're using astero-seismic parallaxes that can be inferred using stellar models and red giant stars that are oscillating in order to figure out uh, what the Gaia systematics are. And so this work is led by Sanya Khan, shown here, and uses uh, red giant stars in the K2 campaigns, the Kepler field, and then the Southern Continuous Viewing Zone of TESS to uh, basically predict what should be the parallax, and then that can be compared to the measured parallax. And so this uses uh, stellar models, oscillatory uh, numbers such as the delta nu and the numax, uh, spectroscopy and photometry, and does this for a set of about 12,250 giants from these three missions. And in particular, we're interested in the low extinction red clump stars that are actually the best suited to do this kind of analysis. Um, with a detailed assessment of the different systematics, we're currently at the level of five to 10 micro arc seconds to which we can really predict uh, the parallax coming from the astro seismology. And what we see here is the difference between the EDR3 parallax of the same stars minus the parallax uh, predicted from this astro seismic treatment. And you see here this beautiful trend as a function of magnitude. This is very much what Lindegren also showed in their calibration of this parallax uh, bias that they see. And indeed, uh, if we show here the three different campaigns, Kepler, all the K2 fields together, and then TESS prior to applying the Lindegren correction, and then after applying the Lindegren correction, what we see is that in particular with Kepler, where we have the longest baselines and the highest quality photometry, that systematic trend really disappears at these magnitudes, something fainter than 11 or so. Uh, and if you look really closely, this is extremely close to zero. So this is a very strong suggestion that actually what we did in these cluster Cepheids is correct because we're also using this magnitude range here. We also, by the way, did a test involving the LMC for the cluster parallaxes, and it also turns out the same way. Now, we also have this information for K2 and TESS. And one thing you may have already noticed is that in Kepler, this number is above zero, and in tests at bright magnitudes, we're at below zero. This may hint at a shortcoming of the Gaia parallax corrections at bright magnitudes, which is not too difficult to understand because it's based on relatively few stars that poorly sample the whole sky. It's only a few thousand stars that have been used at these bright magnitudes. And so presumably what we're seeing here are some limitations to that correction. So. Until now, I've been talking about the absolute calibration of this distance ladder, really the footing on which this is based. Now let's go and take it to the next step, which is uh, this intermediate part where we're calibrating the type 1a supernovae using Cepheids in such galaxies. Of course, when we want to do this, what we need to be absolutely sure of is that the Cepheids that we calibrate locally are equivalent to the Cepheids that we can observe elsewhere. And there can be a range of differences between those two samples that we need to account for in order not to incur a bias on the Hubble constant. Some of the things that have already been studied quite a lot recently uh, are, for example, dust mitigation. So I mentioned these Wesenheit magnitudes. It seems like a little bit of black magic where you're invoking a reddening law. You then combine this with a color and you get something that is reddening free. That may not be true for every individual star, but if dust has some sort of average property in the universe, we're sampling thousands of lines of sight in all these other galaxies, then it's also kind of natural that you would converge to some sort of average. And in addition, because the calibration and the application is done in the same way, then there's very limited room, in fact, to have a significant bias coming from this. Second is uh, a lot of work recently has gone into identifying how the chemical composition of stars changes the luminosity and how Cepheids in different environments, this can be even within our Milky Way, or it could be between the LMC, SMC, Milky Way, or other galaxies, how that would affect the distance ladder. But that turns out also to be a very small effect, both because we have already measured spectroscopically the metallicity effects um, in, for example, with Louise Breval, or and uh, the range of metallicities spanned by the supernova host galaxies is actually really limited and well within the range where it's calibrated. One thing that has come up a lot in the past are binaries, but binaries end up not being a problem for distances primarily because almost all Cepheids are in binary systems. Uh, 
So unless somehow the distant Cephids are systematically different in terms of their companion properties from the ones where we calibrated, then there can't really be too much of an issue. And so we've used radial velocities as well as Gaia amplitudes and so on to look at this. And there just doesn't seem to be room for anything more than 0.004% or something like this. Uh, a bias that I'm going to be talking about next uh, that is a little bit more concerning, but still not really, uh, for as far as we can tell right now, and not really a game changer, is the stellar association bias, also related to clusters, but in a very different way as what I talked about earlier. And I'll also briefly mention some relativistic effects uh, that I've studied in the recent past. So let's first get to this stellar association bias. Uh, I'll walk you through a small cartoon to tell you what, I'm, uh, what this is about. So let's consider a field of stars in some galaxy where we want to measure a Cepheid. So these are background stars, and we have some Cepheid that's residing in the middle of this. We want to measure the photometry of that Cepheid because we want to use that to measure the distance. So of course, in the Milky Way, this is a straightforward measurement, and we're not affected by these nearby stars. Crowding, however, becomes a problem as you go to greater distances because your finite angular resolution element starts to include multiple sources in the photometry that you measure uh, for the, the source of interest. Now, thankfully, usually you can test how much of a background you incur statistically, even if it's not entirely precise for each source. Statistically speaking, you would over or under predict, so you can do this without bias. You can estimate that background and simply subtract that from your Cepheid photometry, and that turns out quite nicely. Actually, the, the uh, crowding tests that have been done that continue to be done indicate that there's no, uh, there's no systematic here. However, you, of course, incur an additional error when you're doing this, a, a loss in precision, I mean. However, Cepheids are young stars, and as I mentioned earlier, they occur occasionally in clusters, and clusters have physical sizes that are kind of fixed because they're gravitationally bound systems. It turns out that that's roughly about four parsecs, and four parsecs is the size of one pixel of HST with C3 at the average distance of 23 megaparsecs of supernova host galaxies. So this is quite annoying because, of course, now the uh, aperture that contains the Cepheid will be biased by the cluster, but the background aperture where we can test the light contribution does not account for this effect. So we wanted to measure how, uh, how much of a bias we could incur from this. And together with Adam in 2018, we set out to, uh, to estimate this in M31 as a supernova host analog because of the availability of HST data. But now we can actually do this in M101 in a supernova host galaxy, thanks to some UV observations that we've collected with HST. So this is work led by Zoe Spezieri and Bastian Lengen here. You see the two fields in M101 where the Cepheids are known. And uh, here I'm showing a, a couple examples. Uh, we have the UV images at the top, then this is V-band and I-band. The position of the Cepheids are indicated by these red circles, and then you can see increasing amounts of UV flux in the vicinity of these uh, Cepheids. The UV flux is the dead giveaway that there is a cluster here because they're young stars. So the clusters are dominated by UV flux, hence how you can identify them. So we did a really careful astrometric matching in order to be able to uh, measure exactly at the positions uh, of the Cepheids how much UV flux there is. Uh, we did a visual inventory of how many clusters there are, and there's about 24 cluster Cepheids compared to 219 field Cepheids, which comes out to be of order 10%. However, we also see that the uh, clustered Cepheid fraction is really strongly correlated with the amount of star formation locally. So uh, this is something to be accounted for potentially going forward, where we can maybe select certain areas that are more or less affected by this kind of um, uh, bias. So what we did here for the time being is we tried to estimate this uh, total bias of the distance, which would be a multiplication of the clustered Cepheid fraction by the typical bias incurred for each of these cases. And we do this simply by identifying here in red the Cepheids that do occur in or very nearby clusters, and we remove those from the fit and we compare it to random variations of the fit uh, by bootstrapping. And we find that in this particular case for M101, the distance would have been underestimated by 17 millimagnitudes. Now, this is, of course, not much. Bearing in mind that the current distance ladder already contains a correction based on our M31 result, 
uh, the effect of this for the overall Hubble constant measurement is even more reduced. So it's maybe at maximum 0.5% at this point. We're also looking at how this uh, bias would operate as a function of distance because we can project the image to greater distances and repeat the analysis and see how that would affect the measurement. And you can see here that the bias increases a little bit. We're already accounting for some things like uh, amplitudes decreasing when there's too much crowding and things like this. So this is currently our best guess, but overall there's not really much room for more than about a half a percent or so movement in the Hubble constant. So uh, a quick summary of this, we're using HST observations to separate this. We're finding a clustered Cepheid fraction that is similar to the Milky Way, even though we have limited room for doing this comparison, because here this is a, the clustered Cepheid fraction as a function of age, which is actually an interesting thing. These Cepheids, they are born in, in clusters probably, and then the clusters disperse over time. So you really see this here as the clustered Cepheid fraction goes down. Now, I mentioned earlier, we have only about two kiloparsecs or so in the Milky Way where we can measure the Cepheids and clusters. So we're kind of lacking some of the uh, young, very luminous Cepheids here. So this estimate is very noisy, but in the part around hundred million years or so here, we have about 15% or so of Cepheids and clusters. So the Milky Way and M101 are actually quite similar in that regard, which is also a, a useful thing to know. Um, Right, and so just to say, I think overall, in the very worst case, this is at about 0.5% uh, of a difference, but we also have NGC 4258 observations in the UV, so this is going to be next. And of course, one of the interesting questions will be how much this differs per galaxy and maybe per uh, field in a given galaxy. Now let's get a little bit to the relativistic corrections that we've corrected for. Perhaps some of you will have seen uh, Back to the Future and recognize the, the time machine here. This is essentially what this is referring to. So we have a universe in expansion. There's cosmological redshift as we go to greater and greater distances. But locally is where we calibrate our Cepheids at essentially zero redshift. However, we want to measure Cepheids in galaxies that contain type 1a supernovae. So there is a small but non-zero cosmological redshift that applies to these galaxies. And because we're measuring periods, we're essentially looking at clocks. And so these clocks are dilated due to cosmological redshift. That is a problem because what we want to do is we want to apply this calibration that is calibrated at uh, observer rest frame but really we have these dilated periods. So what you need to consider is essentially this uh, what log one plus Z uh, effect on uh, the, the logarithm of the period that you measure and the more distant gal um, Cepheids, and you have to correct for that in order to ensure an unbiased measurement. This is already taken into account uh, now in the latest uh, shoes data release. And what's interesting is that this effect ends up increasing the Hubble constant when you correct for it. So uh, that just to say that not all the biases that we may have that are currently in this distance ladder have to resolve the Hubble tension. Some of those may make them worse. We just need to make sure that we're accounting for all the physics and all the effects that are really there. Another thing we looked at are K corrections. So some of you may already be quite familiar with that. Essentially, you have a, an object in the emitter frame that is emitting some light. That light is reddened by host dust, is then redshifted, then extincted again by Milky Way foreground dust, and then observed locally. But we're then trying to compare this somehow to an extinction correction or these Wesenheit magnitudes that use reddening laws that are uh, calibrated locally to try and measure these, uh, these distances. And it turns out that this can be a problem at the level of 1% distances if we're using individual filter bands, even with James Webb. So on the right-hand side, we see here uh, two cases for a 10-day Cepheid and a TRGB star or a star close to the tip of the red giant branch, we see the K correction that is required uh, by these simulations. Uh, they're just synthetic photometry really as a function of redshift or distance as is shown up here. And you see the different lines correspond to different photometric passbands. Uh, the blue line here is V-band. So that's of course where this is strongest. This dashed line is the Wesenheit magnitude in the H-band that is used right now to measure the Hubble constant. Turns out that that fortuitously combines 
differently signed K corrections. So it ends up being essentially uh, very close to zero. But if you want to use, for example, James Webb in a single photometric band, and you want to go to about 100 megaparsec, which is the Hubble flow, then you're at the level of about a 1% systematic bias of these distances. So K corrections will be something that have to be applied uh, to these very distant standard candles. So we looked at three different kinds of effects here. Uh, all three end up increasing the Hubble constant. Sorry, the numbers here are not the most up to date, but the, the sign in which the arrow is pointing is still accurate. So the time dilation effect is the largest of these three. That's already included now in the shoes distance ladder from 2022. The K corrections are really small in the Wesenheit formalism, but will be relevant uh, for individual photometric bands, in particular for James Webb. The effect on the reddening slope turns out to be really tiny. So in, in principle, you have to change the reddening slope that you apply for the Wesenheit magnitudes because also the reddening law is, of course, redshifted. But that is really a very small effect. And of course, if we want to increase precision for the distance ladder, what we would really like to do is increase the number of supernova host galaxies. And given the finite uh, volumetric rate of type 1a supernova explosions, the only way of doing this is increasing the, the distances at which we measure, at which point k corrections and other relativistic corrections become more relevant. So with James Webb at 100 megaparsec, this is already a 1% effect. Now, I think I still have about five-ish minutes. So I'll uh, just say a few things. Uh, about some of the things that we're working on in terms of stellar physics. Uh, one, those of you who follow a bit exoplanet uh, work is that they often say, know thy star, know thy planet. Maybe we can say, know thy standard candle, know thy distance by improving the understanding of these stars. So here with Giordano Viviani and Sri Ashete, we're uh, running the Velo Velocities of Cepheids project or Veloce. The data release one is currently uh, being worked on. Uh, hopefully by the summer, this will be out. Uh, there's a, it's going to be the largest catalog of Cepheid rate of velocity time series measurements to date. Uh, we have more than 18,000 observations of 256 bona fide type 1A Cepheid, uh, type 1 Cepheids with a median of 57 observations per star from both hemispheres. So from La Silla and from La Palma. And the precision is really uh, unique among Cepheid uh, time series data sets, as good as two meters per second, thanks to the Koali spectrograph mounted here to the Euler telescope that you can see down here at La Silla. Uh, and this data set is really a wonderful treasure trove uh, of pulsation phenomena. Uh, we uh, really see new features here. We see uh, we can do a systematic study of binaries. And of course, we are learning a lot also about the time series data that have been published as part of Gaia DR3. One of the interesting things uh, that we can do with these Cepheids is that we can look at the Herzsprung progression, but in radial velocities. So the Herzsprung progression is a well-known feature of Cepheid light curves. Here, we're looking at the fundamental modes. Uh, phase is simply time divided by the period. And then these objects are stacked as a function of logarithm of the period. And uh, you can see a little dent here at around phase, maybe 0.7 or something like this. And if you follow closely, as you go to longer, to longer periods, you see how this is moving over to the left to shorter phases. This was identified by Aina Herzsprung, uh, I think in the 20s or so of the last century, and is now understood to be a resonance feature of the pulsations. Now we see that, of course, in the radio velocities. Uh, but even more interestingly, if we look in detail in a particular region, what we're starting to see are double bump features that are currently not explained. The only place where we have seen this so far is using test data of a single other Cepheid. But here we have 20 or so of these kinds of stars. So we're going to be able to probe uh, the pulsation of these stars in unprecedented detail, thanks to the high precision of the radio velocity measurements. We also have a very large sample of spectroscopic binaries among these 250 Cepheids. About 75 of these are single line spectroscopic binaries. And here is a plot of the eccentricity of their orbits with respect to the orbital periods, which can be nicely compared to population synthesis uh, in a way that has not been able previously. And in addition, we just identified this one particular Cepheid here, which is the shortest orbital period for a Milky Way Cepheid in a binary system known. So this is even less than a year 
almost in this kind of exclusion zone of the population uh, studies. So this is all really interesting in terms of how these stars evolve dynamically. Uh, and the, the paper by Sri Ashete is um, very close to completion. We're also looking at increasing mass measurements, because of course the mass measurements would be what really help us uh, figure out what is the mass luminosity relation of Cephades, and we need this mass luminosity relation to predict the period luminosity relation. Here we're looking at Cephades in the LMC, so this is a, a PL relation where you have this Vesen height I band versus log P, and the interesting thing is when you have a Cephade and a binary system where the companion is a giant, the light contribution is sufficiently strong that it lifts the Cephade up, whoops, from over the typical PL relation. And then you can know that if this is really a red giant star, first off, you should see the companion spectrally. The star should look redder than it would otherwise look. And the amplitude would be depressed because the amplitude is a flux variation. And if you're adding constant flux, that diminishes the amplitude. So we set up this uh, observing program exactly this way, looking for these kind of um, features. And we identified uh, all these um, blue and uh, blue circles and then pluses here as first overtone or fundamental modes that would be likely SB2 systems, and indeed 90 plus percent of these stars are really SB2 systems. So we're about to increase the number of stars where we can do mass measurements by about a factor of 10. And then there's lots of other things to say regarding the variability of Cephades. They're really not as simple as we previously thought. For example, uh, we see low amplitude multimode pulsations once we correct for long-term modulations of the variability curve. And here you see uh, four uh, OGLE4 LMC data together with Maria Suveges. We published this in 2018. The ratios of a secondary period to a first period, you see these nice ridges in this diagram that tells you that these stars are really multimodal pulsators. Um, we see in the radio velocity data cycle to cycle variation. So where really the amplitude from one cycle to the next can fluctuate a little bit. And it turns out that this is probably a coupling between convection and pulsation. That should be very interesting to study further. We also see month to decade long trends, which we haven't understood yet. And we're still trying to figure out really what the periodicities are. We see really complex line shape deformations that may be signs of non-radial pulsation and could maybe give an astroseismic window for further study. And even using interferometry, we use the VLTI in, with the auxiliary telescopes and baselines of more than 100 meters to look for how the angular diameter changes over time. And we saw that the maximum diameter at two subsequent cycles didn't quite look to have the same angular diameter. So we're really starting to look uh, into these pulsations in unprecedented detail. We're also seeing that the period changes that these stars exhibit don't quite match what stellar evolution tells us. So this could, lead, this could be indicative of maybe some issues with uh, uh, the evolutionary timescales. Uh, and as, as we go to more and more detail on individual objects, it really becomes difficult to get a very good description of individual Cephades. Now, all of this is extremely complex, of course, there's lots to be learned here. Uh, and that should be the takeaway from this, Cephades are more complex than we thought. But I want to assure you that even though this is something that I've been trying to look for, and I really am interested in the uh, complexity of these stars, none of those things that I just told you about really matter for the Hubble constant measurement because the fluctuations in period are just too small to shift anything on the PL relation and because changes in the mean magnitude are also too small, uh, they're easily absorbed by the instability strip width itself. So I think there's a big opportunity here for stellar physics. I do not think that any of the things I just mentioned are issues uh, for the Hubble constant measurement. So I'd just like to wrap up and again, thank my team for, for all their hard work and their contributions. Um, in summary, we have this Hubble discord that we're trying to understand more. We're trying to see how does the measurement uh, react to us achieving a better accuracy, of course, and then possibly this could indicate some shortcomings of Lambda CDM um, or maybe in the end, it will be a measurement error, but honestly, we've put so much effort already into 
trying to see where the error is. I think if it would have been something obvious, we would have found it by now. So uh, it's either not on the distance ladder part, or it's probable that there could be some, uh, some new physics we don't yet understand. The shoes distance ladder as it is right now is a, has a stated accuracy of 1.4%, and that is around already seven times better than what the Hubble uh, key project delivered in 2001. And we're working to improve that further to 1.0% so that we have the early and late universe measurements on an equal footing, roughly, in terms of precision. And with this hipsters project, uh, thanks to funding from the Swiss National Science Foundation and the ERC, uh, we're working to mitigate these uh, systematic errors, improve the precision, and of course, also uh, get uh, some opportunities here for stellar physics. Thank you very much, Richard. This was a very exciting talk. Well, maybe we start with taking the questions. So very interesting overview and very interesting results. So thank you for, for your talk. So can you comment on the uh, on resolving this issue, not by, uh, by a Lambda CDM crisis, but by the idea that we are living locally in an under dense region? Yeah, if you have an under, under dense volume, then the Hubble constant local expansion would be larger. Is that solution ruled out? Or, uh, it, what do you know about it? It appears so. So I did not do this work myself. It's difficult then to comment in detail on this. Um, but it seems to be something that keeps popping up again and again. The supernovae more or less rule this out. There's a paper by Darcy Kenworthy in 2021 that shows this quite nicely using the supernovae. I think one of the issues is that if you go to distances where the galaxy catalogs become incomplete, you may find something that maybe looks like this in a spurious way. But um, I, I don't think that we see this in, in the data. Um, so in the CFAS period luminosity relation, there is a, a gamma term for um, uh, metallicity. Right. And uh, uh, like how much it is reliable, the gamma term, because in the Bruval paper, uh, they just use like uh, three galaxies uh, to estimate the gamma. And uh, uh, in the end, like how much it will impact in the final estimation of distance. Uh, right, so this is, of course, a difficult measurement. You need to somehow measure individual spectroscopic and um, abundances of Cephates in other galaxies. The reason Breval used the LMC and the SMC is because that facilitates the problem related to uh, the residual parallax offset. You could use, in principle, also the Milky Way, which actually has a very long metallicity lever arm, but then you have a problem of correlation between the apparent magnitude and the distance due to this residual parallax term. So that is actually simpler if you're using the LMC uh, and the SMC. Uh, I don't think I have a plot for you, but there's a very nice plot in the Shoes 2022 paper that shows the distribution of abundances of the supernova host galaxies with respect to the Milky Way and the LMC and the SMC. And all the supernova hosts are essentially contained between the LMC and the Milky Way cephates uh, that are part of this measurement. So having measured this gamma term in that range really minimizes any uh, additional, um, any residual error there. Uh, I, honestly, I think uh, it's difficult for me to give you a number off the top of my head, uh, but I think in particular, what was nice in the Breval paper is that using individual spectroscopic analyses, she finds a very similar gamma term to what has been inferred by the distance ladder formalism. So there's also consistency there. We also see from the stellar models, actually from the Geneva models we published on in 2016, that even those models have the same size roughly, uh, I think point, minus 0.2 point two, uh, two or something like this, and here they use minus 0.25. So there's a consistency from the models to what is being done spectroscopically to what has come out of the distance ladder fit. I don't think that this is, we would want to improve this to get better precision, but I don't think it's a, a major accuracy uh, problem at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, for a very nice talk. I was just wondering, everything you said, you tried to kind of change the distance ladder and was that your uh, Hubble constant would actually increase the tension? Not everything. But, but the, are there mechanisms you can think of that really would decrease it? I mean, are there mm -hmm. physical mechanisms that you would think could make, I mean, if the problem is, it, is in the distance ladder, which you don't know, but 
are there things that you can change to that still physically to make it the tension less? Yes. So that stellar association bias that I mentioned decreases the value of the Hubble constant. But only by 0.5%, not by five. Exactly. Yes. So 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 are there other you things you need... can think of that would decrease it? Or would you I mean, there are several things. So Maybe I think, it is I think one than... of the things that would decrease the Hubble constant would be if there were a significant crowding issue. Uh, if you have not physical association, but chance blending crowding kind of problems. However, those are already tested uh, based on the HST data alone. And there was a really nice paper recently where there was a, a serendipitous observation of a Cepheid hosting galaxy with James Webb, where you have the better spatial resolution, but the measurements were not done for the end of measuring Cepheid. So in terms of signal to noise, the data weren't so good. But Statistically speaking, they found a completely unbiased measurement from HST, which has four times or so better spatial resolution than HST uh, in F160. So I really don't think that it can be crowding either. Um, if you have other ideas, let me know. I'd be very no, happy I, to I trust don't them. Have, I was wondering if you had, or, or because I see mostly talks and that may be my bias of the, the, the kind of the, the distance ladder should go down in that direction. So what you said, it's zero redshift. The Hubble constant determination should go down, but maybe it could go up in the other side. I, I don't know that. Um, I, I'm not knowledgeable about it. So of course, if you wanted to somehow make the Hubble tension disappear and you wanted this to uh, align with the Planck value, you would have to move a lot of measurements down in this kind of diagram, right? And some of these are completely independent, other are somehow related. So for example, these measurements here involving the tip of the red giant branch, they also scatter a little bit, but they're on the same side of this tension as the Cepheids. Uh, you have things like uh, masers. So this, this is the mega maser cosmology project where the same method is applied as, a, uh, as for the calibrator galaxy NGC 4258. So it's radio measurements of masers orbiting galaxies. That gives you a value of the Hubble constant completely independent of Cepheids, albeit with a bigger error bar, yes, but it's still on that same side, we have here also, for example, um, where was this uh, lensing, right? So we have the strong lensing measurements that are also done uh, in Gaxing by Sherry Suyu and in EPFL by Fred Cobain and others, where it's using strong lensing time, de uh, time delay cosmography it has nothing to do with Cepheids and also gives you a higher value for the Hubble constant. So I find it very difficult then if we were even to push down the Cepheids, that would not still change anything about these other indicators. That's why I think um, it's difficult to argue away. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, just on the slide before, you showed us the period uh, or the magnitude dependence of Cepheids depending on oxygen abundance. But I guess in terms of physics, this would be rather, I guess, helium abundances or something like that in the outer envelopes. So is there any chance for a bias in the sense that if you calibrate your Cepheids locally to what you measure in oxygen and then to far away distance galaxies where you probably have different measures for oxygen that you use as a proxy for something that does physics. I'm completely agnostic about this. I have no idea. I have a second question, maybe if I may, and this is then rather going into the future, is our standard sirens from gravitational wave, are they going to help with this? Are they in I between? So. Or maybe you can comment on this. It would be great. Yeah, thanks. Two very interesting questions. So there's a subtlety here when I'm showing uh, this diagram. And in your question earlier, I was referring to spectroscopic abundances of individual Cepheids. We have the luxury of doing that relatively locally where we can have uh, high resolution spectra from eight meter sized telescopes. But that, of course, does not work at 20, 30 megaparsec. At those locations, we're using H2 regions that give a strong line ratio uh, oxygen abundances. Thanks to these latest measurements, we now have also oxygen abundances in stars. And so now we're trying to compare oxygen to oxygen, of course, measured using different indicators. So yes, there is still uh, some room for discrepancies there. However, that's also been already looked at, for example, by Rolf Kudritsky using superstar clusters in nearby galaxies where they can get the oxygen abundances from, uh, from, stellar, uh, from the stellar phase and compare that to the strong line ratios. So it doesn't seem to be a big problem. Of course, we'd like to do better. And I think the ELT will be fantastic to push the limits of this individual spectra. Now, in terms of gravitational waves, that's also extremely exciting 
for the time being, we have a single source that was used, of course, that's the gravitation wave event 170817, the kilonova where there was a uh, an optical counterpart identified to a gravitational wave signal at a distance of something like 43 megaparsecs, I believe. And that measurement has been discussed quite a lot in terms of uh, a Hubble constant measurement. And I do think that it featured here. We see that here in brown. The uncertainties are quite large and they depend quite a bit on the modeling, in particular on the inclination of the source with respect to our line of sight. And presumably as these methods mature more, we're gonna do a lot better. And there are some projections that uh, this should eventually also allow us a 1% measurement of the Hubble constant, which would of course be completely independent even of the electromagnetic <laughs> uh, light that we get from the Cepheids, though we still need the redshift. Um, from uh, electromagnetism. So this is really exciting. And I think uh, with the recent update to LIGO, uh, there should be increased sensitivity to kilonovi. So presumably going not too distant into the future, this will be uh, very interesting. Then Einstein telescope and also the uh, cosmic explorer will be really, really sensitive to kilonovi. So this was a growing field and I'm really excited about the the results that they're going to get. There's also the dark sirens, if I may. So these are black hole, black hole mergers where you don't have the optical counterpart that was for a long time discussed as a very good opportunity of doing this. But this is, seems to be really limited by galaxy catalogs at the, uh, at the present time. So the, the precision coming out of those is not competitive at the moment. Thank you. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, so type two cepheids are uh, population two stars, and therefore uh, for a particular magnitude they are one point five me uh, magnitude fainter than uh, classical cepheids. Um, so with JWST on board, uh, uh, what is the potential of type two cepheids in distance ladder? So I do think that they can play a role in measuring distances to individual galaxies. Uh, they're not that frequent, I believe. So if you look, for example, in the LMC, there's not, not nearly the same number of type 2 cephades as there are of type 1. And uh, there are uh, three subtypes of type 2s. Um, in particular, I believe it's the RV Tauri that are the most luminous. Um, I don't think that at the present they have the same precision to the period luminosity relation as type 1 cephades. Um, so, of course, you want to use the most precise distance tracers to, to increase the precision on the Hubble constant. If you, However, I think that they have a, a role to play to measure distances to other galaxies for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Then let's thank Richard again. Thank you very much.